The following program will be interrupted for any important war bulletins. And now, CBS Radio brings you... again, this is Jack Benny welcoming you on behalf of the Longines Symphonette for a warm visit to a magic world and to a golden treasure chest of memory, entertainment, excitement, drama, and world history. Yep, we are going to explore the world of golden radio. I was part of radio as it developed, just as I am part of television. I share with Bing Crosby, Bob Hope, Red Skelton, George Burns, Lucille Ball, Arthur Godfrey, and many others, a common heritage in radio. I'd like to help you enjoy again those nostalgic moments when the family gathered together in the living room to share the make-believe world of radio. We will look in on comedy, drama, suspense, news, and the people who made it all possible. Before we get started, though, I'd like to tell those of you who are just discovering the golden days of radio how it differs from today's television. Radio was really do-it-yourself television. Instead of a big, ugly glass picture tube, you saw the performers in your own mind. You were not restricted by the boundaries of a 21-inch tube, but instead painted your own big-as-life version of each moment with that loving, creative brush we call imagination. Now, just in case you're out of practice, here's a little test to demonstrate the power of your imagination. Now, don't open that door, McGee! Didn't you see that fabulous closet just as clearly as though it was on the largest full-color television screen imaginable? Why, every time McGee opened that door, a million Americans saw a closet in their own homes. It didn't take long for the daytime serial to be known affectionately as the soap opera, named after the sponsors. Let's listen in. Oh, Lorenzo Jones. The rocky road that winds through Joyland Amusement Park, the Jones' latest venture, is paved with good intentions, the chief of which is Lorenzo's plan to sell his newly discovered sulfur water as a cure-all. He's persuaded Bell to let him try it out, using their chicken barbecue stand as a base for operations. Lorenzo's nephew, Henry Whitcomb, thinks, as always, that his uncle Lorenzo has something there. Henry's wife, Nellie, suddenly stage-struck, is interested in a screen test, ever since a moving picture director working with a group of actors in Townville has casually asked Nellie to come over and watch them work. Today, Lorenzo, Belle, and Henry are at the barbecue stand preparing for the first customers to try out Lorenzo's sulfur water. Let's listen. All right, Henry, now if you'll grab hold of the other end of this barrel of soft water, we'll set it right here on the counter of the barbecue stand. Now, Lorenzo, you and Henry be careful. Don't knock over those glasses and dishes I've stacked up. All right, we'll be careful, Aunt Bell. No, easy, easy, Henry. All Henry, right. uh, uh, turn to this side with a uh, figure facing us. Yeah, uh, that's right. There. There. <laughs> now, I'm a good wife, we're ready for the crowd that'll come here today to try out my sofa water. Well, dear, I only hope your new health drink won't interfere with the sale of my barbecued chicken. Well, Belle, you see, the, the healthier they get imbibing my super sofa potion, the more portions of chicken we'll sell. That's right, Uncle Lorenzo. Sure. The healthier I feel, the more I want to eat. Gee, do you think we'll have a big crowd out here today? A, uh, well, a, a big crowd, Henry. Well, here comes the first auto of the cavalcade now. <laughs> You'll find people coming out in droves, thanks to the power of American advertising genius. 
another $50 worth of handbills judiciously distributed, and we'll have everybody in the world calling for sulfur water. Well, dear, maybe you're right, but aren't we supposed to have a permit or a license to sell a health drink? Well, a, a, a permit to help people regain their vim, vigor, and vitality? <laughs> well, Bill, who, who ever heard of the Good Samaritan with a druggist license, well, huh? Yeah. I suppose I'm wrong, but things are always happening to us, and... Is your imagination getting tuned up? Good. Now let's try a more ambitious test of your imaginative power. of Helen Trent. Romance can begin at 35. Radio was responsible for many great inventions. Another kind of daytime radio program was the interview show. Now, Mary Margaret McBride is still on radio in many cities. Her guests have ranged from the great political figures to folks in the news. I don't know whether this is really a respectful way to speak about a vice president, but one of your, uh, one of the boys who uh, do some work around your office, Mr. Vice President Barkley, said to me, doesn't that guy ever get tired? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, how would I know? He said, well, I didn't mean you to answer the question. It was just one of those rhetorical yeah, questions. Yeah. He just said that you tire them all out. Somebody at the... Uh Meet the press yesterday out in the audience asked me that question if I never got tired. And what'd you if say? I, I said I I have never had a feeling of fatigue or exhaustion in my life. I've always worked hard, but it may be a bad thing, because if I got tired I might go off and lie down and rest now and then. But never getting tired, I just keep on. Uh -huh. That's my answer, and that's the truth. I never do have a f sense of fatigue or exhaustion. Never in your whole life. I bet you that means you don't worry. No, I don't, really. I don't mean that I don't uh, think things over seriously, but I, I, I've got a philosophical view that worry it doesn't solve anything. And they tell me it creates ulcers in the stomach. Oh, yes. <laughs> I've known them to get it. <laughs> now, Mrs. Barkley, you can tell us whether he really lives by this or whether this is one of those things men say now and then. No, it really is true. I can't possibly keep up with him, and I can tell you a cute little story about him that someone told on him when he was campaigning in 1948, either in 48 or 50. And he was touring very, very uh, terrifically heavy schedule over Kentucky in a very small plane, which was piloted by a good friend of his, and a couple of the young men that were helping out, my husband out, were along also. And he'd been hopping all over Kentucky for weeks and speaking here, there, and everywhere, making five and six speeches a day, and he had all the men absolutely beat down. <coughs> he, of course, feeling perfectly fine. They got in the plane to take off to go on to their next engagement, and the pilot, who's an old friend of my husband's, said that he just absolutely was so worn out from this terrific campaign and from trying to keep up with him with not nearly enough rest for an ordinary, normal person to go on, that he was in the, uh, had the con at the controls, of course, and to his utter horror, he suddenly came to and realized that he had dozed and found the vice president 
very calmly, just flying the plane. He knows nothing about it whatsoever, at all, absolutely nothing. And the pilot was so frightened for just a minute, he didn't quite know what to do. It gave him an awful shock. And he said, oh, oh my, Mr. Vice President, he said, for goodness sake. And my husband said, well, that's all right, Charlie. He said you look like you were kind of tired and needed a little nap. <laughs> of course, it was one of those little bitty planes, I must explain, that almost flies them. Well, yes, it was, was Charlie Gartrell. Last year. And he said you just whipped him down, absolutely. <laughs> Oh, I don't know how you do this thing. But uh, well, I, I, I certainly would have been a little bit... Though. That means he's never afraid either. No, he hasn't a nerve in his body, not one. Now, back around 1926, radio invented something else. Sponsors. Sponsors have provided comedians with more jokes than the Los Angeles smog. Red Skelton made his first radio appearance in 1937 on the Rudy Valley Show. And soon after, he was credited with this comment. The longest word in the English language is the one that follows. And now a word from our sponsor. But one of the reasons both radio and television were able to provide free entertainment of the highest caliber was the advertisers who paid the bills. I'm sure you'll find a chuckle or two in these famous radio commercials. The first you hear is from Interwoven Socks, reputed to be the first singing commercial. The singers are the famed Billy Jones and Ernie Hare, who were known as the Happiness Boys. How do you do, everybody? How do you do? It's great to say hello to all of you. I'm Billy Jones. I'm Ernie Hare. With the Interwoven Bear. How do you do, The brushless shaving cream supreme Leaves your face so smooth and clean Rinse so white and rinse so bright L-A-V-A, L-A-V-A This is Sandy Becker saying, Keep cooking with Crisco. It's all vegetable. It's digestible. Longine is not lightly called the world's most honored watch. For Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes and 28 gold medals. Longines watches have also won more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is a product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Radio pioneered most of the kind of shows you see on television today. Humor, for example, breaks down into two basic formats, the variety show and the situation comedy. Both forms reached a peak in radio. 